Well, as soon as we hang up the phone, I'm probably just going to go and like, you know, eat some Cracker Jacks, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> and like steak. ignore everything that we just talked yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome to another episode of Sons of Ignatius podcast and a very happy Easter to all those who are listening and we are very happy to be back with you. My name is Father David Lugo coming at you from Miami, Florida and with me as always is Father Nile. How you doing, buddy? Hi, Dave. How you doing? I am very happy to have you back in the podcast again. I had to do this all by myself last time because you were busy with something called Holy Week and Easter, I believe. I know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But hey, I, I trusted you to fly solo and look at you. You soared. I busted out an episode all by myself. Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> I am very proud of you. I'm very proud Thank of you. you. And I I am glad that you were able to do that. I was swamped here at the parish. We've had some illnesses in the house with some of the guys. And so things have been shuffling around and it was Holy Week. And anyway, but it worked okay. out really well. Can I just ask you one question then? Even though it was hard, did you die and rise again? You know, it's an ongoing daily thing. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of dying, you know, and a lot of, and some rising, okay. and some good, rising, good, for good, sure. Good, 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 well done. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been a good Easter uh, so far, but you're also at a parish. How was the Holy Week for you? So, yeah, it was my first Holy Week and, and Easter as a priest, um, or certainly as a, really? well, not sorry, not as a priest, but working as a priest, put it that way, because last year I wasn't yeah. really so involved in parish ministry. I was still in studies. And I have to say our our ceremonies just flowed very nicely. I just had a sense of nice. each day flowing into the next. Um, we had we had beautiful music and lots of, you know, lots of involvement from the parishioners um, from, you know, getting their feet washed on Holy Thursday to, you know, all those readings and psalms on uh, at the Easter Vigil. Um, and yeah, and, nice. yeah, and just a sense of arrival on Easter Sunday. So very nice. It wasn't anything too fancy. Um, we just sort of stuck to the script a bit, but we had it was beautiful in its own way. That's great. That's great. It was it was sort of in the last minute of Holy Week. Uh, we were already begun with Holy Week, and the man who was charged with celebrating the Easter Vigil uh, could no longer do it because of illness. And so okay. I inherited the Easter Vigil <laughs> a well couple days before it. And so wow. it was just a it was a wonderful opportunity to be like, all right, let's see how this goes. <laughs> to make an inside joke, how was the blocking? You know, the blocking was on point. I must say, I must say. Yeah, yeah word to our <laughs> listeners, that was that was the one takeaway from our liturgy class in Toronto. You always have to think of where the people are standing and can the people see them and can you see them and it all comes down to blocking. Yep, yep. I did think about this recently. I, I had a I had a private baptism last right. week and it was not a familiar space to me and I, I had no time to prepare the blocking uh, at all. Yeah, and disaster. So I was stepping on my own feet, you know? Anyway, we're not talking about blocking today or liturgy. <laughs> well, not primarily. But it's okay. It's okay. It's good to hear that you're doing well. So anyway, so you and I are getting back on the horse here today about what we wanted to talk about mm -hmm. from a few episodes ago, which is our new series on Catholic social teaching. You and I have been talking about Pastores Double Vobis, and if there was anything mm -hmm. from the four pillars of priestly formation that we thought maybe needed some some more bolstering or some some more underlining, and so we right. we spoke at length last time uh, transitioning to the more social component, not just individual formation for mission for mission and ministry, yeah. but looking at the social component, and so how we as a church have been very adamant in the last 150 years about you know our Catholic social engagement. How is it that we are members of a social body right. that has certain concerns? And so, you know, we spoke uh, a few episodes ago about the history of Catholic social teaching from Rerum Navarum all the way up until Laudato Si and other encyclicals, many encyclicals and magisterial documents in between. And all of those catechetical pieces from the magisterium have been distilled down in various formulations to various principles of Catholic social teaching. So you and I are going to take four of those themes and dedicate an episode to each one of them. I'll just list them out really quick before we get started today with one of those themes. The first theme, which is actually not not the one we're going to talk about, but I'm just going to mention it first is because many commentators say it's the most important, and we'll get to it in a future episode because it deserves it deserves a lot of consideration, which is the dignity of the human person, being made in the image and likeness of God, and much of our social concern hinges on the question that the human person is not just part of a collective, but has individual rights, responsibilities, and dignity. And so we'll be talking about that at length in a future episode. And then dovetailing off of that is a second major theme uh, within Catholic social teaching, which is the dignity of work. Especially there are encyclicals like John Paul II's Laborum Ex 
exorcisms from the 1980s about the rights of workers. And that's one of the main topics that started this whole thing with uh, Leo the Thirteenth with Huerum Navarum, is the rights of workers and the dignity of work itself, you know, and, and that being a major theme of Catholic social engagement. And then, you know, related to that, again, maybe a third theme that we could distill down a major, many of those themes that are smaller into one category. These are some, uh, some jargony words, but we'll talk about them in a future episode. Subsidiarity, solidarity, and cooperation. How it is that we engage uh, social questions as as a community and as a as a group, you know, thinking about our concern for the needs of the, the most vulnerable. And the last one, which actually is the one we're going to start with today, because I really want to hear from you and your own experience studying this topic in Paris and also in London when you did uh, a special master's on the topic, is care for God's creation, especially since Laudato Si was published a few years back. There's just been a lot of concern within the Catholic world about the care for creation as stewards of creation and as men and women who are part of this world and not just, you know, users and abusers of our natural environment. And so that's the last thing that we'll cover. And actually, we'll start with that today. And so, yeah, what do you think about that? Do those sound palatable to you? Yeah, I think we're going to cover a lot of ground on those four themes, Dave. I think one thing that they all have in common, you know, when, when we say it's Catholic social teaching, you know, this raises the question of not just how should I behave as an individual, you know, what are the, the moral norms or whatever that, that I should be looking at for in my personal life, but how ought we live together and in what way should should our collective and community life uh, be organized and, you know, what, what principles should should we follow? So that's where Catholic social teaching comes in. Right. You know, I, I got into this through the, the environmental angle because obviously it's not just a question of do I recycle or not? That's just a personal ethical issue. But, you know, how do how do we uh, organize our society and our collective living in order to right, look after right. God's creation? Because it's it's something that God has missioned us to not just as individuals, but as a church community. Um, so, yeah, so that's my way into this. Very good. Yeah. And I think maybe as our as our guiding light uh, for the conversation today, we are going to look at Laudato Si as sort of our magisterial text. And I, I think you, you spent a lot of time studying this text. So I'm going to ask you, how would you organize a conversation around this theme to, to make it palatable to our listeners? Uh, what are the major topics that pertain to care for God's creation? Because this could easily collapse into a certain environmentalism or a secular, you know, maybe concern for a green movement or something like that. How is it particularly a concern for Catholics that this is God's creation that we care for? And what are the what are the major ways in which we can get at this topic? So yeah, Dave, to give some shape to this conversation, I propose that we follow the structure of Laudato Si itself, the encyclical. Okay. There are six chapters. Let me say that for a start. There are six chapters, an introduction in six chapters, and that the six chapters are basically organized according to the dynamic of see, judge, and act. Uh, so that the first chapter is really about just seeing what's happening in the world, like shining a light on on the phenomena, you know, how our ecosystems, etc., are breaking down and the ecological problems and social problems that are coming from that. So just, you know, having a look. And then say two, three, and four are more judging what are the, the roots of this problem. So yeah. looking at scripture, looking at some big ideas like the technocratic paradigm and, you know, perpetual economic growth, things like this, um, economic models. And then the proposal, Francis' big proposal is in chapter four is integral ecology. So this is the paradigm that we ought to be uh, living by, integral ecology. And then chapters five and six are more about action. Uh, what action can we take individually, uh, collectively to turn this around? So so I think that's a nice a nice way to, to enter into us. And nice. just to start uh, with chapter one, which is what's actually going on? What are the problems that are surfacing? Yeah, you know, really quick, you know, sort of as a, as a macro comment uh, before you jump into the particular chapters, I just think there's something to be said about that paradigm of see, judge, act. It's, it's one of the ways in which this is a particularly maybe sort of Catholic or even Jesuit angle, perhaps, that the Holy Father is is using, you know, to address a topic of import to people who are not Christians. And it's a it's a really beautiful way to, to bring back what you were mentioning a few episodes ago about sort of that Ignatian paradigm of seeing something and then assessing it and then acting upon it. And it seems just so basic and rudimentary yeah. uh, in terms of our conception of how engagement happens, but it really isn't. I mean, so many times in my life, you know, I, I see what I want to do and I shoot and then later I aim. Like, I don't really top in and think about what is the proper mode of judging before acting yeah. and taking it 
calmly and assessing, it's actually a very Christian disposition, thinking about how it is, uh, maybe like in the Jesuit world, Ignatius, you know, in the meditation that he gives in the spiritual exercises on the incarnation, it uses this triple paradigm, you know, is that the, the Trinity sees the world and assesses the world and the need of the world for a savior, yeah. and then later sends the second person into the world as an as the incarnate son, you know, to, yeah. to redeem the world. So, so that paradigm, I just want, I don't want to let that go too quickly or briefly, that that's a paradigm that I think the Holy Father brings to this conversation right out of the gate, which is a helpful thing in a, in a world, in a topic that's so often dominated by economics or dominated dominated by ideology mm -hmm. or dominated by fear or fear mongering or mm -hmm. maybe obsession or any number of things or over domination by science where it's just a scientific concern. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. This is actually a theological concern. You know, it's care and it's also creation. So we're not just talking about maintaining ecologies, but we're also caring for something that is theological in nature. Yeah. To take you up on that, Dave, like when you're trying to look at the world, like we're always bringing a certain lens to that. So for example, the scientists you know, let's say the climate scientist looks at the world and what does he or she see? Uh, well, they see that there are now 200 and whatever, 47, I don't know, parts per million of, of CO2 in the air. And in a sense, that's what they see. And that doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Or, or right. they might see that the the average temperature um, is now 1.2 degrees Celsius higher than, than pre-industrial levels. Uh, so, so they'll take these kind of measurements. And it's true. Like, both of those statements are true. But another person might just see, wow, when I was a kid, when you were going for a drive, during the summer, there would be a lot of flies getting kind of squashed on your windshield, uh, on your windscreen, you know, in the car. And that doesn't happen anymore. So it, mm -hmm. it could be just a lot more mundane, normal life stuff that they're seeing. Or, or wow, you know, there used to be a, this river used to be flowing with a quite lot of water and now there's much less water. Or, I mean, but whatever it is, like you, you have to look, regardless of what lens you're looking at the world through, do step back and do take a look. Because it's not like, I think our, our primary means of, of receiving information these days is is news. And news tends to be kind of, you know, newsy. <laughs> It's it's just it's just well what what happened in the last not even twenty four hours like the last like two hours yeah. and and yet when we're looking at the health of our planet it's it's a much more slow moving story you know like a, a glacier right. melts right. very slowly and yeah. yet consistently and so it's not a newsy thing and that's probably why scientists their lens is particularly appropriate for this problem because they do look at things over time and look for trends and how long-term trends whereas most of us i suppose are conditioned i guess to well ask well what's happening today or <laughs> What's what's the next thing that's yeah, happening? Yeah. Well, um, there's, there's right. not much news to report. It's just gradually, slowly getting worse and worse. Sure, sure. What's interesting, though, is that, and, and I think this is probably where I find myself in a lot of these conversations. I, I think I find myself maybe stuck more in the judge part of the of the three movements here. Because I see in the world, you know, what uh, is certainly presented to me and also what I experience uh, in terms of uh, ecological change and, and things that are alarming. Mm -hmm. But I find myself kind of stuck in the judge uh, section where I don't really know, like, why do I need to care about this? So, like, that's sort of a, a silly, strange, a juvenile way of asking the question okay. but it's it's a question i think a lot of people do have is why do i need to care about this is this something that really matters uh or is it just alarming for the sake of being alarming you know is it an alarmist sort of thing right and i think that trend can start to chip away at uh and also preclude the action that is required of us as christians to engage god's creation in a caring sort of way because i might find myself stuck in the judging part it's like well isn't this part of like the natural rhythms of you know ecological systems or maybe it's exacerbated by human involvement but isn't that our prerogative isn't that precisely what we are allowed to do by being stewards of creation to be able to, you know, use it and, you know. Yes. What would you say to that kind of objection? I would say, you know, when, when you ask the question, you know, why should I care about this? Yeah. I would say, well, let's focus for a bit first on this. Like, what is the this that you're talking about there? Because I find the people put more effort into looking and seeing what our current reality is, I would just say quite, I don't want to say automatically, but don't find it so hard to care about this because they've spent more time looking at this and just, yeah, yeah. you know, educating themselves on what the current state of affairs is. And if your house was on fire, would somebody need to tell you to care about this? Uh, no, it's because once you've seen that your house is on fire, you care. That's that's just it. Yeah, There's not yeah, a whole lot yeah. more thought needed. And it just so <laughs> happens with the current sort of climate and biodiversity crisis that it takes a while to see it. That's the hard part. 
is because because it's so easy to yeah, look the other way right. and not to look because it's not an immediate thing right in front of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm chuckling because I'm remembering a, a, a cartoon that I saw, a comic that um, was about uh, global warming and all that, and uh, about this temptation or this tendency within uh, naysayers. And the first panel was like, you know, someone pointing to a glacier and being like, global warming, like, this is not a real thing. Look at this. And then it was like, 20 years later, uh, it's like a small ice cube. It's like, what is this global warming thing? It's like, look, there's ice. Like, there's a little ice cube here. And then, like, 20 years later, there's, like, a little puddle of water by his feet. And he's like, all these alarmists, global warming. Look at this. We have, there. there's a puddle yeah. of water right yeah. here, you know? It makes me chuckle because it's, like, in this geological time frame, you see yeah. the the degradation of uh, creation. And I don't see that because I don't operate right. in a geological time frame. So my sense of sight uh, is very much, yeah. uh, you know, limited, you know, certainly by my own limited framework. Yeah. And that's difficult because then if I don't really care about things that happen on a geological time frame, it's difficult because it's a too right. big, you know, it's too big of a thing to really grasp yeah. or even see, you know, my vantage point yeah, is way so too So there limited. are people whose job it is to see in this way. And I suppose there's a question of trust. Yeah. Do we trust these people who are trained to look, right. you know, at these phenomena which are unfolding over long periods of time? Do we trust them that what they are reporting is true? There is a big question of trust there. I would also say, Dave, that Reading chapter one of Laudato Si, it's a hard read and not because um, it's conceptually difficult or anything, you know, that it's using complicated language. It's not. It's, it's all very simple and it's written for a general audience. <laughs> but it's just, it's just hard to read about and take in what's going on to, you know, how, how our environment mm -hmm. is being destroyed. And, you know, Francis is right. Like sometimes he does use sort of strong images and he says, look, we're basically turning it into a rubbish tip and you read that and you go god wow. I'm, I'm quite sad you know and, and i'm i'm part of that so it is <laughs> it is tough going in a way just to kind of take in okay in terms of you know what's happening to our soil what's happening to our air what's happening to our plants and our animals um and just the massive die-off that's going right. on right you know to go from being quite oblivious to all of that because you know, we're just getting on with our day-to-day -day stuff. To go from that to looking at, you know, zooming out and seeing all of this degradation and death, I'm afraid, that's happening. It's it's quite shocking. You know, it's it's sad. It's hard yeah. to take in. So, yeah, so sure. I'd say that to people then before reading chapter one. It's like, okay, take a deep breath. <laughs> it's right. not good news right. just yet. Yeah, wow. Yeah, no, that's that's tough. As you're talking and thinking about that, going back to the caring question, I think I think two aspects of being met with such a stark reality and a difficult assessment of what is being presented and what's what I see. I think one of the ways that I can make progress in trying to see why I should care, uh, one of them is, you know, if if I believe that God's creation is something that's a gift to me, it's not just my home, but it's also God gave us creation mm -hmm. as a gift and a place to be. What does it say about my relationship to God if I mistreat the gift? You know, if, if you gave me a gift and I just sort of discarded, ignored it, abused it, what does that say about how I perceive the gift giver? You know, or what does that say about my relationship to you as someone who I supposedly love or loves me if I take something that you've given me and something mm -hmm. as essential as my home even and say like, oh, you know, I don't really need to care for this because it's not that big of a deal or because it'll it'll renew itself or mm -hmm. just that, that kind of cavalier attitude is ultimately an affront to my belief in maybe God in a sense. Like if God has given me something as a gift and is good, why would I not want to care for it? And that's kind of your point, your knee-jerk reaction about like, you just do care, you know, when you see your house on fire. Well, you also do care when the person that you love has given you something yeah. that's of value and it's being, you know, dragged through the mud, yeah. you know, literally. And I guess the other little thing to add to that is, there's a second thing about caring. When you're met with such a thing, I think one of the things that's important with this topic that is precisely one of the things that makes it Catholic social teaching, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, like the dignity of the human person is an essential component to each of the themes. And I think with care of God's creation, one of the things that in a secular context sometimes gets muted a little bit is that it's not just concern for the gift that's given to us in creation for its own sake, but it's also because human beings are also created in God's image and this is where we live and also how many issues of poverty, how many issues of future generations and contamination, illness and all that are exacerbated by yeah. contaminating our, our living space yeah. for other humans, you know? And so when the human person is put back in focus as, no, 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 like we are sick if we are not caring for the air that we breathe, 
well then the human person is very much jeopardized you know in his yeah. dignity uh or in her value um yeah. by not caring for the creation where they belong so anyways those are some things that help yeah. me enter to that seeing thing with more care and saying like i see this and i'm alarmed yeah. because i'm worried about my sister who isn't born yet and won't have food do i love her or do yeah. i love god <laughs> and anyway yeah. so those are some things that help me just just to go back a little bit to something you said um you know what what's my relationship to God, the the giver of this gift. I think that the environmental crisis, it has made me more aware of how little I think of God as creator. So, you know, I guess for for people who really believe these days, um, we tend to believe, I think, very strongly in Jesus. Like that seems to be the, the critical question. You know, who is Jesus? You know, is he the son of God? Is he divine? Is he just a good man? And, you know, Jesus, let's say, most prominent role in salvation history is as redeemer. And I think we've focused so much on redemption and redemption from sins and sort of conversion from vice to virtue and and holiness and all that. It's that the doctrine and and the sort of event of creation gets overlooked a little bit. I think we tend to assume that everything exists (laughs) <laughs> and always has existed and we take that very much for granted and now we're just trying to redeem it and that's what God does you know God helps transform and and heal and and elevate and all that well hang on a second before any of that transformation and healing and forgiving can happen the thing has to exist in the first place <laughs> and um right. we do believe that Jesus was involved in that creation event through him all things were made as it says in the creed i think we need to get back to yeah. that Jesus the Jesus yeah. The creator, the second person of the Trinity involved in that creation process and that the creation isn't just a gift from God the Father. It's also a gift from Jesus, from the Son. And mm. I think if Christians could, you know, accept that idea that, you know, it is a gift, you know, it doesn't have to be, <laughs> like all this didn't have to exist. It does exist. And it's thanks to the gift of God the Father and God the Son. Sorry, Holy Spirit, to be avoiding you. But, yeah. you know, we, we have such a connection <laughs> with Jesus that to recognize it, all of this is a gift from God the Son as well, because through him, all things were made. Right. There we go. That's, for me, that's a really right. good spiritual way into this whole question. I love that. And, you know, maybe to add a, another nuance to this is, is one of the things I think about with creation, the Father as creator, mm. but also the Son, the Logos, the Word, you know, through him, all things were made. I often like to think about, and this is a, a way of approaching the question about evolution that I think some people often miss as a nuance, is that we can also speak about God's creative mm-hmm. act as a continual act that God brings all things into being now and sustains them into being. So, you know, it's kind of like asking the question, you know, when was the Big Bang or something? <laughs> right. It's like, well, always. Yeah. It's like it always was because all of time was wrapped up into that. Or where was the Big Bang? Well, it was yeah. everywhere because all of it was sort of localized into that space. And so, like, when did God create the universe? <laughs> well, yes is the answer, you know, is now, always. And so I like to add that wrinkle into this just to help me remember, like, especially as you're emphasizing Jesus's role in creation, not just at the beginning of time, but all through time. Well, then how am I actively working against his act of creation? So am I a, a co-worker with God in bringing in creation, creating new things, life, you know, literally bringing in new life into this world through the sacrament of marriage or being an artist, a co-creator with God in creating beautiful things or using our intellect to create uh, wonderful works and all that. But also in creation itself, am I actively working against the creator who is currently creating mm-hmm. um, by destroying, you know, not being a steward or a co-worker. So I think it's an interesting nuance too of what does it mean to be a, a friend of Jesus, a disciple, a, an apostle, a co-worker with him if part of his work and labor is to be creating in the, mm-hmm. you know, in the progressive tense. And if I'm actively destroying, <laughs> then I'm I am an antichrist, perhaps. Maybe that's a dramatic way of saying it, but like there's something there about an active work against the work of Christ. Sharp intake of breath. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you put it very strongly, Dave. But Yeah, I mean, it's maybe dramatic. But there is a question here of taking sides. Are you on the side of God, Christ, who is trying to give and cultivate the gift of creation? Or are you on the yeah. side of those who are trying to to destroy it or who don't care let's say whether it is destroyed yeah. or not yeah there is a taking sides that needs to happen here and sure. it's not it's not sure. a kind of once and for all decision you know it's a constant reapplication of ourselves and rededication of ourselves to caring for for the gift of creation but it is putting ourselves on god's side for sure yeah 
Yeah. So uh, moving through the chapters again. So, you know, we started off by seeing the reality um, Mm -hmm. and noticing that reality. How does how does the Holy Father take us into a space of judging at best? Yeah. So after. Yeah. So chapter two is is that scriptural lens and, you know, talking about what we've just been speaking about, that it is a gift and we are called to steward it. And that's just reminding ourselves of that. And then chapter three is looking at some of the ideas that are that are driving the crisis that underpin the crisis. Uh, One of them is the technocratic paradigm. Ooh, what's that? A uh, technocratic paradigm is one of the features of modernity, I would say of the modern industrial uh, world. Francis calls it an ironclad logic, where basically humanity takes the approach of using machines and computers and, and the logic of machines and computers to solve every problem without really thinking about how creation has its own I would say more organic logic and instead of like going with the grain of creation, say the organic sort of dynamism and, and grain of creation, we take our, our computers and our machines and we just put them to work on the land or, or on people or the seas or whatever and we just churn it out. And, and ultimately this is destructive because we're, yeah. we're not working with nature's own sort of intelligence uh, to put it that way but we're imposing Mm. a particular human way of thinking scientific technological way of thinking we're imposing that everywhere and nature and society is suffering as a result of that right so okay that's quite abstract can i give an example um maybe just to to make it more real wendell berry is a is an excellent writer on this he is a an american philosopher writer and farmer and basically he took the decision several decades ago to return to his home in Virginia or Kentucky, don't know which one, and to farm and to write. And he would basically say the land is intelligent and each piece of land has its own wisdom and fruitfulness in it. And he avoids, you know, bringing in, let's say, big machinery and chemicals to run his farm. He allows the land to give what it's going to give and that this is a way of actually helping the land to flourish. So there is is a big debate out there at the moment in the agriculture world between sort of large-scale technocratic farming, industrial farming, which just brings in the machines, brings in the chemicals, is purely focused on increasing yields per hectare or whatever, just get the most out of the land as possible. Uh, so that's, say, the old approach. I say old approach, the new approach. <laughs> Whereas the old approach, like the the, the really old approach is, yeah. no, like allow the land to produce <laughs> what it's going to produce and care for it and really be a steward and don't try and squeeze too much out of it. And actually the land will really flourish and become more mm. and more fruitful because what we're seeing is that, you know, in terms of soil quality, just by trying to squeeze as much out of the land as possible, like the soil is effectively dying in many parts of the world wow. and like we won't have that many more crop yields and we can't just rely on more and more fertilizer etc so that's a real life example of technocratic sure. paradigm versus let's say a more organic integral ecological approach yeah so one of the questions i have you know on that topic though is like are we talking about a crisis here of degree or of kind and what i mean by that is so even the organic natural paradigm still uses a plow so like technology is still used to help increase yield and also facilitate the process the natural process and to encourage it to be more fruitful perhaps than I could be with my own two hands. So what does that then transition to becoming the technocratic paradigm where it's no longer just about using technology to help me, but it's now becoming something else, a a difference in kind and not just of degree. Uh, Do you see a clear line there somewhere? Because the farmer, even someone like a Wendell Berry, I'm imagining is not just using his two bare hands, you know, while he's farming. Yeah, but okay, so he is asking a different question, first of all. It's like saying, okay, what can the land provide here? What goodness is here and what are the organic processes that if I allow them to develop here will naturally work? Well, then once you get a sense of those, well, then you can work with them. And, you know, maybe I'll use my horse or maybe I'll use my tractor. I don't know. But essentially, I'll be working with the grain um, and trying to help nature do what it's already trying to do rather than starting. Well, I've I've no idea what nature is trying to do here, but I'm just going to dig up this field and plant, you know, wheat. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm going to, and, and I'm going to add a lot of fertilizer and a lot of nitrogen and etc. And yeah. I, you know, without even asking the question, well, what what is the capacity of this land? So yeah. yeah, I mean, I take your point, Dave. Like this isn't a question of going back to the Stone Age, but it right. is a question of seeing well, what is available here. What are the natural yeah. processes here that that I ought to allow to flourish? Right. So. 
Yeah. So I would say a crisis of kind rather than degree. Yeah. Because you can use a tractor and still be a good farmer, you know, (laughs) but it might just be on a smaller farm looking after the land better. Uh, then on like a massive farm with like 50 tractors, which are just plowing everything up. And, you know, right. I think that's what we're talking about. Sure, sure. So another way, another way that I think that I, I think about this distinction, which I, I like this distinction a lot, and I think it's a very useful one in many areas of life and not just with farming. And it's the distinction between harmonizing with a natural process or imposing, you know, a prescriptive solution that doesn't really like sympathize with what's in front of me. You know, so yes. like from a pastoral perspective, like, am I a listener to the person who's crying in front of me or am I? just throwing you know cliches or solutions at them like am i someone who has empathy and harmony with my surroundings or with the context that i'm in or am i someone who just imposes and i think it's a fair question to ask in so many different areas of pastoral life and so like with the ecological it's like this is a good question am i naturally harmonious with my surroundings or am i very much an alien to my own surroundings and i think about this for example with uh, like my own allergies i've been thinking about this a lot recently with like i don't acclimate really at all to anywhere that I go because I'm always living within like a refrigerator. Like I, like I'm always, I'm always in an air conditioned environment. Right. So like my body doesn't naturally, or my, my allergies don't naturally acclimate to where I am because I always close myself in sort of like, uh, you know, I, I have a sealed environment that's always air conditioned. So I don't really exist within my natural environment. I'm always within artificial structures. Um, and so I don't have a harmony with my environment. And so that affects my health. And I think that's one of the ways in which this paradigm distinction is helpful. Like, do I have sort of a natural, integral, coherent myself belonging to my environment? Or am I walling myself into man-made artifices and even changing my climate, which ends up changing my own experience of my natural environment and making me sick sometimes? Yeah, that's a really good example. The other one is, is, you know, to continue with agriculture, is is our food. That, you know, I, I know for when I go to Europe and I buy food from local markets, which is, you know, selling locally grown produce, it's just better than what I buy in the supermarkets here. Like tomatoes actually taste like tomatoes. Sorry, tomatoes. Tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you say tomato. Uh, <laughs> um, but there, you know, if I, I would say industrially produced food does not taste as good, nor is it as healthy mm. as organically, you know, locally sourced food. So, you know, if we're getting to the to the action point here, um, it's OK, I would say find those farmers and those sellers who are producing and selling really good food and support them Mm -hmm. and you have to go a little bit out of your way maybe and you have to spend a little bit more but you're getting way more value you're getting way better food and and it will keep you healthy there's a big movement at the moment of you know food as medicine like food isn't just nutrition you know it's not just a source of energy it's also a source of health yeah so i would say the organic the organic movement you know agricultural movement is actually it's providing more than food as such it's providing health right so it's worth paying for for sure sure i had a season of my life where (laughs) where i did want to eat better and Mm. i've had some of those seasons Mm -hmm. and some of them are shorter than others (laughs) uh and there was was one recently, maybe a few years ago now, uh, where I started to think about the objection to what you just said, which is, well, you know, eating organic, eating local sounds great, but it's way too expensive. And I started thinking about that and I realized, actually, <laughs> how about we flip the script? How about we say that's actually what food costs and what you're paying for Correct. other things <laughs> Is you're just not buying food. Thank you, Dave. Like you're you're paying for other things. <laughs> and so yeah. like food actually costs this. Yes. And <laughs> thinking about it that way, it's like, oh, it's not too expensive. I'm just not buying food in other circumstances. Yeah. I'm paying for plastic or I'm paying for yeah. whatever, you know, pesticides. Yeah. Like that's another thing. Like when you go to a local uh, farmer's market, like a much bigger proportion of the selling price of what you pay actually goes to the farmer. Whereas if you mm. buy in a supermarket or, you know, Walmart or, or something, the farmer gets pittance. And, wow. and most of it goes to, much higher proportion goes to the transport and to the seller itself. So when you buy local, you're actually you're giving more to your local community and your local community is really going to give to you then as well. Right. Right. You know, it's interesting, like as, as we've been talking, this topic is is one of those that I find myself dipping back into periodically, especially when I talk to you, because you're so good at this and so passionate mm-hmm. about it. I also often find myself having mental reservation where I say like, well, as soon as we hang up the phone, I'm probably just going to go and like, you know, eat some Cracker Jacks, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> and like Mistake. ignore yeah. everything that we just yeah, talked yeah. about. Yeah. And it's just an interesting thing about like mental reservation and this kind of maybe, maybe getting to the action mm-hmm. piece of it, like you were mentioning, you know, sustainable mm-hmm. farming and also with supporting local mm-hmm. growers is that I have this, uh, there's this so 
much momentum that keeps me from changing but also i very easily put everything that we just talked about into a category of like oh yeah i mean that sounds idyllic and good and mm -hmm. but i just feel like it's just too easy to not do that <laughs> and i'd rather not you know and it's just something that i reflect on yeah. myself that that call to action it's it's really difficult for a lot of us to really change uh our behavior because the structures are so pervasive and so massive that it might just be like well it's just easier to just ignore all that it's really not my my problem but it's like well this is this is partly why there is such a crisis because no one feels the urgency to yeah. do anything about it. and i would say that applies to most areas most ethical decisions in life dave like so let's say it's hard to be a believer today like you know yeah. because in the west the general trend is towards non-belief so how do you manage to continue to to believe in and and love god well you actually the first thing you do is you join the other people who are doing that and yeah. the first question of belief is not let's say the second question <laughs> i know but like you know a primary question is uh, not just what do i believe but what am i a part of am i part of the community yeah. of believers like Get yourself connected to the rest of the community who believes. And then you'll find it's not so hard. I mean, it still brings us challenges, but uh, you sure. can certainly overcome those challenges and, and you can be part of a community of believers. I would say it is the same with any kind of social change. It's not mm -hmm. just, okay, you'll be able to do a little bit by yourself, but really you have to get yourself connected. Uh, with fellow, whatever, eco, sure. ecologically minded people. And then, then it becomes a lot easier. Right. Right. No, I mean, this is this is the wisdom of the Catholic worker movement. It's the wisdom of people living on homesteads rather than, mm. you know, living in suburbs and all that. I think it's a really beautiful uh, reminder that our faith is, I was thinking about this actually yesterday when we were uh, reading for Mass. It's like the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, you know, was... Uh, one of these Easter ones, which is the community of believers was of one heart and one right. mind. And I, pr I preached on that. And I think it's to your point that that's precisely the remedy or, you know, just the, the, the precondition for perseverance is having a network of support. And in the absence of that, it's like, well, you know, overturning, you know, big farming is yeah. not something that I'm going to do this morning. And yeah. so, <laughs> but like we can live and support each other, you know, in that. And I, it's one of the things sadly and tragically that in my community life, uh, generally as a Jesuit has not been, it's, there, there are moves mm -hmm. in the direction of being more socially conscious mm -hmm. of this, but has generally not been a priority. And that's one of the places where I think I could make some inroads because I could then have support, you know, with guys that I mm -hmm. live with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. We, we have to do it together. We either do it together or we don't do it at all. I, I really believe that. So key question is, what, what are you a part of? I keep coming back to that again. What are you a part of? Are you right, part of right. the community that's doing this or that's trying to do this? Remember, I don't know if you were, I think you must have been there, Dave. Do you remember when we were in Toronto, I went down to the farmer's market one weekend and bought, I think I got sausages and, you know, just veg and whatever. And I cooked a nice meal for us. Gord yeah. was there. And like, I remember going down and getting such a buzz out of the whole place. It was alive. It really was. Like, there were so many sellers there and, and producers and growers and, you know, selling really good quality stuff. Conversation happening all the time between buyer and seller. You know, tell us about this veg or how did you grow it or what's good about it how did i how do i cook it how do i prepare it so much social interaction going on and i thought wow this place is alive compared to wow. when you go into a, a large supermarket and you know the cashier is kind of forcing a smile and go oh, hello good morning how are you? you know i mean they're not they're not they're not just right. quite as invested in the whole thing as 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 the guy who's selling you the stuff that he's grown in his own you know in his own garden or whatever his own right. so yeah once i would say once you do get connected into these communities and these social realities you really want more you just want more mm. it's so attractive it's so much more alive in my experience and mm. yeah i would say at the moment jesuit communities are not shining examples of that i would say aliveness and and vitality mm. that yeah. we do tend to take the path of least resistance and but there, there are people who are really moving in that direction younger guys especially i think of uh, xavier de benazé in france uh, jacques saint laurent in um, in britain you know i think i think that consciousness is rising i know a lot of younger jesuits who have either become vegetarian or, or just cut down radically on their meat you know the, the danger is that you you just look at the the older guys who are kind of set in their ways and just kind of give up on them and i think you have to stop yourself going there 
and say, look, if, if it yep. weren't for these guys, I wouldn't have my vocation in the first place. So That's look, right. we, we have to move together. And that means, sometimes that means being patient as well, but continuing to ask those questions and to probe a little bit when you can. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so we're coming to the end of, uh, of our episode today. And I just want to, maybe as a, as a final statement, I, I just want to point out that one of the things about this topic that has uh, really stood out to me in this conversation is how often my mind went to other themes of Catholic social teaching. Like there is very much this, you know, seamless garment, you know, mentality mm-hmm. within the Catholic social world is that like we, we very easily went from talking about care of God's creation to talking about the dignity of the human person, you know, as someone that we care about as, you know, as belonging in this mm-hmm. world, but also speaking about God as the giver of all good mm-hmm. things. But then also like when you were talking about sustainable farming or local farming, my mind went to one of the other themes that we'll talk about in a future episode, which is subsidiarity right. or, you know, cooperation or solidarity. Like those are topics that matter, you know, or the rights of workers, you know, the rights of farmers. So these themes all are so interlaced, which I think is a beautiful point in and of itself is that like the Catholic worldview is singular in a sense it's like we believe in all of it simultaneously yeah. that like we believe in jesus the redeemer who is also the creator uh you know we believe that you know the rights of workers is fundamental uh not just for their dignity as a person but also for caring for god's creation it's like this and it's difficult because i think there's a juggling all these things and i might treat them all as disparate you know topics of my own individual concern and i think it's one of the yeah. things that you've been harping on a lot is that you know making it an ethical concern that i have to be concerned about the creation of the world or or the rights of the workers who work for me, instead of saying like, no, no, we as a collective community of believers take all this on as our worldview. Mm-hmm. Like we see the world this way that, you know, creation is charged with God's grandeur or that individual people are made in the image and likeness of God. So uh, this whole single garment, seamless garment idea is a very beautiful one for this sort of as a meta point, you mm-hmm. know, that when we talk about Catholic social teaching is that we're really just talking about a Catholic worldview and seeing things in a more holistic and, you know, integral way, you know, to use that word from Laudato Si. You took the words out of my mouth, Dave. Integral. Yeah, integrated, <laughs> yeah. integral. That's the way of the kingdom. Absolutely. All will be one. Very good. All right, buddy. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, we'll come back next time for another one of these themes. Good to talk, Dave. God bless. All right, dude. Take care. See you, buddy.